know, what another transfer of the addiction, the one that I didn't realize until like just recently, probably in the last year, was that I was still using, I'd say technology distraction, achievement as my new addiction. When, the, when I'd have a feeling of loneliness, when I'd have a feeling of not enough, uh, when I'd have a, a painful memory, an embarrassing memory, I would, oh, hold on, I'll check my tweets, you know, on, the, on Twitter, mm-hmm. that's a bad mm-hmm. example. That's the one I'm not on. I, I'll, yeah. I'll look on Instagram for the hundredth time. Okay, oh, look what this person's doing, right? So I would just like push that right back down. And then I realized, I finally realized it was reflected back to me actually by a coach I had. Welcome to the... 1,000 Day Sober Podcast. My name is Lee Davey. I am not an alcoholic. I refuse to be anonymous. I am someone that doesn't drink alcohol, and I spend every waking moment of my life helping other people do the same, like right now. Before we get to my guests, I just wanted to just give you a little bit of an update on my life. Yeah, I'm, I'm currently in Cardiff at the moment. Uh, Zia's in school. Uh, we have a 12-month rental here in a place called Punk Canna, and It's really nice to have the nest. You know, it's great to travel around and all that kind of stuff, but it really is nice to have a nest. And I just come back from a three-week working trip in Cyprus, which was um, really interesting and demanding and really pushed me to the edges of my comfort zone um, and to maybe realize a couple of things, right? So uh, at the moment, I'm creating a documentary, a poker documentary, and it's something new for me, right? It's um, usually um, when high performers, one, one aspect of high performers feeling really comfortable is when they know their job inside out, right? Like, like I feel super comfortable being right here on this podcast talking to you lovely people because I've been doing it for so long, right? I'm rich in experience and um, I feel that I have the skill set uh, to do this. So it gives me that confidence. It gives me that courage. But when you're doing something new and you're doing something different, in this case, um, creating a poker documentary and everything that goes into that, um, you don't have that experience and you don't have that skill set where you don't have a top-notch, world-class skill set and and, and a a wealth of experience. Let's put it that way because I'm not a numpty. I kind of know what I'm doing. Otherwise, I won't be employed to do it. Uh, but when you don't have that, your confidence and your courage obviously can wane a little bit because you don't have that backup, right? You don't have that backup. And then what I find is that I need faith. I need reassurance. Okay. I need um, a pat on the back. I need feedback. And sometimes you're not going to get it. In this case, you know, while I'm doing the documentary, it's a pretty much a lonely road. Like my team's like dotted all around the world. It's a very, very small team. So when I need that faith, I need that reassurance, I need those pats on the back and that feedback, I have to provide it from myself. It has to come from the inside out, not the outside in. Because if I'm relying on getting my faith and uh, getting my reassurance and getting my feedback from outside of me in this instance, then I'm going to continue to feel um, very uncomfortable about being at this edge. But if I can just check in with myself and say, hey, Lee, let's just have a little bit of faith here, brother, because everything that you have applied yourself to in your life from the moment that you came out of that birth canal you've achieved to some degree or another. You have uh, the foundations. You have the cellular structure. You are a high performer. And high performers can take anything and they can use that foundation and they can make it work. So reminding myself that everything that I get stuck into usually comes out golden, I can have faith that the same will happen in this documentary. I can have reassurance just in that sentence that I'm orating to you verbally, that is giving me reassurance, right? And I can give myself feedback as I'm going along the way, and I can ask my colleagues as well, and I can do something that I think is really important, and that is find people who do have the experience and the skill set in this particular area and reach out to them 
for guidance and for help and for feedback, right? Now, why is this important and why am I sharing it with you? It's no different than the journey to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol and to live a self-led life. The same factors are there. In my opinion, being someone that doesn't drink alcohol is the end goal of a process of high performance. Like it, in order for you to reach that goal, you're going to have to be a high performer. You're going to have to get the work done. You're going to have to join groups like Strive or AA or This Naked Mind, uh, your Tempest, right? You're going to have to watch recorded videos and do assignments like the Strive Method. You're going to have to interact in community forums. You're going to have to share. You're going to have to support. You're going to have to step up and you're going to have coaches like me say, hey, and just to remind you that this alcohol thing is not really about alcohol at all, right? Like you're drinking alcohol because you're lonely. You're drinking alcohol because you don't feel loved. You're drinking alcohol because you loathe yourself. You're drinking alcohol because your husband just called you a fat bitch and you don't know how to deal with it. You're drinking alcohol because once again, you come home from work after a long day's grind and you ignore your kids, right? Like these are the reasons we drink alcohol. And in order to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol, you've got to attack those things. And you've got to attack those things like a high performer, right? You've got to be the best mother you can be, the best father you can be, the best son you can be, the best employee you can be, the best human being you can be, right? And if you shoot for those stars, boom, you know, you won't even think about drinking alcohol, okay? But it's the same thing. When you think about being someone who doesn't drink alcohol, you're at the edge of that comfort zone again, right? Like, you don't have a mental roadmap for it. You don't have the experience for it. You don't have the skill set for it. So you need to have some faith. You need to have some hope. You need to have some reassurance. Well, what we're really talking about here is motivation, right? Motivation, which is covered in the fourth phase of the strike method. Okay. When you're struggling like this, it really helps to have operating principles. All high performers have operating principles or create operating principles to help other people to become high performers, right? And when I find myself thinking about documentary filmmaking, I'm searching for uh, that those operating principles. I'm searching for the how-to manual, okay? You'll be the same when it comes to being someone that doesn't drink alcohol. And you don't have to create your own operating principles right now because we have them at the Strive Method, right? We have them at the Strive Method. I will show you step by step what you need to do in order to be someone that doesn't drink alcohol and to live a self-led life, right? And really importantly, to be able to generate that hope, that faith, that reassurance, um, that feedback from within you so you're less reliant on receiving it from outside of yourself. So I hope that was helpful. I'm really enjoying the process. It is challenging as F-U-C-K. I am pushed. You know, like Stephen Pressfield, the great Stephen Pressfield, if you've never read The War of Art, read it. He always talks about the most difficult part of the story process is figuring out what this thing is about. I could spend, and I have spent, eight hours a day just staring at my storyboard. What is this about? <laughs> you know, and... You know, someone who's used to seeing and being very tangible in work, like, like you know, what do I mean by that? So if I uh, write uh, 10 pages of a script today, then that's tangible. I can see it. I can feel it. I can, I can yeah, I did some work. But if I thought, <laughs> what is this story about for eight hours? It's still work, but it doesn't feel like work because it's intangible, right? So again, pushing myself to the edge of my comfort zone. So you're pushing yourself to your edge of your comfort zone right now, probably listening to this. You're going to listen to my guest today, Matt Gardner. We're going to give you a lot of advice. Uh, you're going to have a few light bulbs kick in uh, as Matt tells his story. And you'll be like, wow, yeah, okay, could this work for me? And you're going to feel a little bit worried. You're going to feel a little bit nervous, you know? So just reach out to me at the strive method at gmail.com. Okay, I can give you more advice and information on how to get your hands on those operating principles, like I said, the Strive Method, and, and to come into our wonderful, uh, vibrant community uh, and to get involved in our quests and all kinds of stuff. I know this is the hardest part. I know it is, right? But you just got to do it. Nothing's going to change if you don't email me or email somebody else that you think they can help you. Okay? All right, I'm going to talk about Matt Gardner. 
Matt Gardner is a passionate and empathetic recovery coach and life coach who has helped numerous people get out of their stuck stories and move towards the life of their dreams. He focuses on changing your language and words and the stories you've been attaching to the events in your life. Better words plus better breathing equals better life. Matt's vision of recovery includes an active and healthy lifestyle that also includes planning for some very deliberate, relaxing downtime for self-care and healing. Matt is also a talented musician and sound therapist, which complements his work as a coach. And Beyond Covery is a podcast hosted by Matt, where guests come on to share their journeys to and through recovery. Matt battled alcohol dependency from his late teens into his early 30s. He was a daily drinker from 21 to 30. At 27, Matt hospitalized himself with acute pancreatitis. And while this was initially framed as the wake-up call Matt needed, after three days in a hospital, he was back out drinking within 24 hours of being released. At 30, Matt hit rock bottom, which led to three plus years of sobriety. At a friend's wedding, he decided he would attempt moderation again, which he tried for the next several years. And when Matt's dad passed away suddenly in late 2018, who had also been a heavy drinker his whole life, Matt decided that's enough. And on the weekend of his father's celebration of life, he decided to be sober again, and he's been sober since. That's three plus years, folks. So well done to Matt. If you want to know more about Matt, how to um, get in, get hold of his recovery, uh, Beyond Recovery podcast, or to take his uh, Beyond Recovery program, or hire him as a life coach, then check out the show notes on the podcast player you're listening to, or email me at the strive method at gmail.com. So without further ado, I'll shut the hell up and leave you in the capable hands of the wonderful, the beautiful, the talented Matt Gardner. Matt, 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 you were just asking, because for people listening, Matt's just interviewed me and we've literally just carried on and now I'm interviewing Matt. And if you can't see on the video, you won't know what we're talking about now, but you see balloons in that, right? In the background. Yes, yes. My daughter was six the other day. That's, you know what? That's what I was suspecting. Uh, so it was six, yeah, sixth birthday. Happy birthday! She to was amazing. six, and and in the spirit so of cool. being super efficient, my wife's birthday is on the seventh. So I was thinking, if I keep them up until the seventh, I can save myself some money on balloons. <laughs> Dude, I like your style. I like your <laughs> style. You know, I like as I mentioned all of your program and everything. I love your uh, just pra- pragmatic use of birthday balloons as well. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, it's good to have you on, brother. I oh, am it's great to have. I'm going to pull some random needs. So I got a bunch of cards here. So there's a beautiful, beautiful woman called Joy Caffrey. C-A-F-F-R-E-Y. She's been a guest on this show. You should get her on your show. She's amazing. Okay. Yeah. And she sent me these needs cards. I'm going to pull a few. And what I want you to do, I'm going to read it out and let me know how this, um, this need came up for you in a healthy or dysfunctional way with alcohol, right? I like this. Authenticity. Oh, yes. How does that this speak been, to you? Yeah, you know, this one's been going. I, I love how you picked this one. Uh, I had generally been at, ending my podcast with my guests on what they think authenticity is or was and oh. what it was to them. So it's funny because this is reminding me, and then I, I would love to hear what yours, your take is on this. So, dude, this is amazing that just happenstance you picked this serendipity serendipity if you will so and this has been a big thing for me because i know this is one of these words that gets thrown out there be your authentic self speak your truth so i started asking mentors of mine and just other people well what is authenticity to you because it's one thing to say it but what does it truly mean right uh so for me uh the my favorite so far that i've that really resonated with me it's sort of a two-part thing uh first thing is i need to feel safe in order to be my authentic self. So I need at least, and it could be a perception, but just I need to feel safe enough that, my, that I don't have this need, this egoic need or p- to have a persona or turn part of my personality up uh, or be on guard. So mm. I can, if I can speak freely with somebody authentically, it's going to come directly out, like from my heart center, right out to you, right? Whereas mm. if for some reason I have this perception that you're like a threat, I'm going to have my persona or my ego in the way, and it's going to distort what I say. What I say is going to be a lot more ambiguous, uh, or I'm going to be thinking about what you're thinking that I'm going to be thinking or what what Mm. I'm going to be saying, right? And too worried about that. And as a result, I'll say something that's inauthentic or just not really like I'll say something, but like what I mean is underneath that, if you get what I mean. So safety is a big thing. 
And um, yeah, secondly, I guess that's it. It's more of a visual for me is like, if it's straight out from me without any fragmenting of getting like, up through the prism of persona, then I'm being authentic. I like that. Thank you for sharing that. And that, and that even, even you having that, that the, the mask and the armor up is authentically you. There's a reason why you're doing it. I'm actually the other way around. Interesting. I'm, yeah. I'm actually, um, the kind of like speak your truth until someone wounds you speak your truth until someone gives you a reason not to like, I, that's kind of been my philosophy. And, um, so far, so good. <laughs> so, yeah, right. There you go. Yeah. Nobody's shafted cool. me it's yet. Cool. Like, um, yeah. yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a, for me anyway, it's been a confidence thing. Like, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting word though. I'm, I'm so cool. That you picked that one first. Yeah. I'm going to pick another yeah. one for you. Wait there. Yeah, please do. Nurturance. Nurturance. Ooh. Yeah. Nurturance. So this one would show up, I definitely, and this is going to be a good way to, to say, potentially segue into some drinking topics. So when I was basically from like zero years old to 13, uh, I, I lived a very, I guess, nurtured or sheltered life experience. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. I lived in a town that was about 70,000 people, and uh, we were like a suburb of that town. So it was, um, you know, in my perception, it was like everything was how it should be. But I also had this feeling like there was something a little bit missing as well. I don't know. I don't really know how to explain it. But as a kid, I felt a little bit lonely when perhaps I shouldn't have. I, I didn't really know where it was coming from. But yeah, and then when, when I was 13 years old, the book good to go into high school. My, so my high school was grade 8 to 12. There was no middle school. It was just because of a smaller school. Uh, my parents divorced. And then at that point, I realized there was this whole like – sort of faker that was hidden from me. That's how I viewed it anyways, that my parents, it was all like, it seemed very fake. My parents, I didn't actually get along. And there was all this like, so, you know, this 13 years of like nurturance or, or this sheltered existence, I very quickly had to grow up, uh, you know, in a different way. And I felt very detached from both my parents and I felt very alone. And I was starting this new journey in high school where I was like a pretty small kid to start high school in the land of giants, these guys, full grown mustaches, they're six feet mm. tall. I hadn't hit my growth spurt till about halfway through grade nine. And, uh, and so that was like nurturance to me is, yeah, for it showed up in a way that was like, I know the intention was there to, for support, but it wasn't full bodied. If you get what I mean, it left me with less life skills then I then needed to 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 gather or to grow later on, if that makes sense. So nurturing to me feels like a, you know, we talk about I talk about like collapse distinctions a lot. Like so, there's love and then there's worry, and a lot of times like parents have that. My my mom has that right, where it's like love and worry are the same. So it, mm -hmm. it feels like that. Like there is the intention of love and nurturing. But, you know, coming out of it on the other side, I, it actually left me with a lot of growing up to do very quickly. Mm. Are, you, are, you saying, are you saying that you grew up and you felt nurtured by your parents and then when they divorced and it, it opened a big question of, well, why, why would two people who love themselves get divorced? And then that opened up a big question like a big question mark jagged into nurturance it's like hang on everything about my life was fake yeah definitely yeah that's a right. good summary that's a good summary i was that one was that one took a little bit that must have been tough life, but, yeah it was it was and you know uh, you know we talked about a little bit about like you know your traumas as as a you know child and as a teenager and such growing up and you know at the time i honestly didn't think it really affected me too bad. I thought I handled it well. And this is my frame of reference. My brother, uh, he's two years older than me, took it. I, I would like, you know, I'd, I'd say a lot harder than me. He was, he would have to be put on like um, antidepressants and such. And he was, uh, I just remember him just being like such an angry person and he was having a hard time with it as was I, but I felt Lee when I was, when I was 
in between my two parents, I felt like I was actually like mediating or helping out the divorce. What I would do is go to mom when mom was upset and she'd be like, you know what your dad said about me? And I'm 13, right? Mm. And I'd be like, no, no. Like I was with dad and I'd try and like paraphrase or summarize what dad said in order to try and temper, you know Mm. what I mean? So I did a lot of this like really top heavy people pleasing, you know, parent pleasing, going Mm. back and forth, trying to, what I thought I was doing was mediating the divorce. So on on one hand, I thought I was doing this like adult thing, but realistically what I was doing was, was I, you know, these, you know, troubled patterns echoed way into my adulthood up until like, like I'm just over the last year or so coming to terms with things that I was doing back when I was 13 based on this divorce. Mm. Right. So as proud of myself as I was earlier and going, you know what? Hey, I don't, didn't have to take any antidepressants. I'm actually still pretty like cheerful. You know, I I got, sure. I got a little bit of bullying in grade eight and nine, but I bounced back very quickly realizing that there was like this positivity and this like positive mental attitude I was putting on top of this. But I, as a result, I wasn't actually ever letting that stuff to come up. And then you throw the alcohol on top and it was just always numbing that loneliness, that feeling of not enough, uh, you know? So yeah, dude, it took a long time for that to finally come to the surface and realize, holy crap, like I've been doing these patterns from when I was 13, specifically doing that bouncing back and forth with my parents, you know, trying to like, in my, what, what, as best I could sort of temper this, you know, family situation. And yeah, so it's, you know, <laughs> there's a lot there, you know. I can see how you, you end your podcast with that question on authenticity, because, you know, what you're describing there is a young boy, not able of feeling a responsibility, which is beyond his pay grade, right? It's like, I have to be a man right now and I have to, I have to, I have to sort this family out because this family can't sort itself out. So you're, you're kind of like having to go into a completely different role. Um, and I, and I relate to it because I, when I divorced with my wife, without a doubt, my son then stepped into a very unhealthy uh, role as a, almost like a husband you know, like, uh, like right. I'm your, I'm your husband. I'm not your son. Um, kind of like role in terms of, uh, almost like transference, almost like he became me. <laughs> like I left, but the problem right. was still there because he was there. And so there's all that, that at some point he's going to have to unpick. I keep trying to get him to do some coaching, but he, he's like, he's like what you described where he doesn't need, uh, to take X, Y, Z medication, but, in his case, it comes up in anger, mm. you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Thank, thanks for sharing that, you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Mm. That, that was, um, that's why I had to pause on that one. Cause like I, I could feel it coming up, but it, you know, that one is, uh, like I say, I mean, this is, you know, 25, 30 years in the making of unpacking that I'm still unpacking that. So I was like, Hmm, this one won't be as easy as the first. One. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, pre- I appreciate yeah. you talking about it. So what, what was, um, when did you, when did you realize that alcohol, um, had, your, your relationship with alcohol had changed from, Oh man, this is amazing. I love it so much to fuck this is dragging me down where the balrogs yeah. live when, when was that yeah uh so i was 27 years old and uh i put myself in the hospital with acute pancreatitis so i was in there for mm. three days and i was just from like way over drinking like getting to the point my tolerance is built up i would try and drink a 40 as quickly as possible of 40 of rye and you know and um it just came out of this really rough party weekend uh we were out in jasper my girlfriend and i and uh, I'm glad that we came back because Jasper is like about, ooh, I don't know, a couple thousand people. It's a Rocky Mountain. It's in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. And and we just got back to town and I felt really weird. I just thought it was like a like a strange, it was like, it's, it was a hangover, but there was something else inside me. I'm like, well, something's going on here. And then it was like a two day lapse. And then all of a sudden it just hit me and it was like the worst pain I'd ever felt and ended up in the hospital for three days. Of course, they didn't know you know, what was wrong with me. I almost walked out a few times because I hadn't 
you know, wasn't getting served right away in the weight room. I was in the weight room probably four or six hours, just keeled over, right? And uh, as soon as they figured out what it was and they could do pain management, I was like, okay. So at that point, I was like, okay, I did the whole like literally just praying, like, please, like, if you let me out of here, like, I promise I will change, no more drinking, you know, yada, yada, do that whole thing. And, uh, you know, within 24 hours of getting out of the hospital, it was like two or three IV bags to rehydrate me. And so this is, to me, this is like, okay, that devil on your shoulder, whatever comparison you want to use. I, I used to say like the addict part of my brain hmm. started justifying. Literally, as I was walking home from the hospital, it's probably about a 15 minute walk. And I'm passing at one liquor store and I get to the second one. And finally, the voice is like, well, you know what? That was rye that did that to you. Like that was, you just don't drink that. If you stick to like clear alcohol, if you stick to like vodka, I don't think that'll ever happen again. And you know what? Let's just say you've never been a beer drinker. Nobody ever has problems with beer. You're a beer drinker now. So I'm having these conversations as I'm passing mm. liquor stores. And then by the time I got to the third one, I grabbed a six pack. I'm like, yeah, I'm a beer drinker. This will be fine. This will never reactivate what I just did. I'm not going to drink rye anymore. I've learned my lesson, right? So I've mm. learned my lesson to I'll never drink again. Turn to I've learned my lesson. I'll never drink rye again, but I will drink beer. So, you know, within 24 hours of being out of the hospital, I have a beer in my hands. You know, I'm back home with my girlfriend and my, you know, other party buddy that lives downstairs and they initially are like what the fuck are you doing i'm mm. like oh eh, you know, like i'm fine right i'm just kind of meanwhile i'm pretty scared inside of me too because i don't really know what's going to happen you know am i a ticking time bomb and they they're you know you know how this goes right so there's some relief that i you know party mad is back that the party isn't over and then it's kind of permission for them to continue as well right so but at the same token there's like that initial okay is this okay i'm like yeah okay, well, frick, let's do this. Cheers. Right. So that's how it went. But that was the moment where I was like, holy crap, like I almost freaking killed myself. I'm like 27. Like, the, okay. <laughs> Time to really, you know, start listening to, it was more of a feeling before Lee. Like I had this sort of like black cloud feeling, but I couldn't really, it wasn't taking the shape of like mental chatter or imagery. And it was the same thing that you and I talked about when you were on my show. It's like that and I think a lot of people can relate to this. Like I was still getting promoted at work, right? My band was doing well, you know, like I was, I had the hot girlfriend. We had we're the party couple. I own a house by this point. So all these things were leveling up for me. So like, I don't have a problem clearly, right? It was just a mistake I made. So, but this, it was, there was like something inside of me that was like, it was like the, uh, as much as the justifier, the attic brain was chiming in, there was started to be this other voice that was like, okay, like, you realize what can happen now to you, right? So that was my first big, you know, I always say that like my, the universe or God has been giving me lots of taps on the shoulder. That was the first mm -hmm. one. I was like, a that big was a slap smack, on the back. Right. Pfft, big time, man. And, uh, and I was just kind of like, Whoa, that kind of hurt. Uh, can give me that beer, you know? So mm. yeah, that was my first big one though. I, I would love to say that was like the, uh, the end of the line for me, but, um, I, uh, I still had to drink a lot of beer. It really that. is. Yeah, it really is. Becoming ambivalent around our alcohol use is confusing, uncomfortable, and downright terrifying. Alcohol is so embedded in our lives that we can't imagine our life without it, and at Strive, we get that. So why not take one step at a time, starting with diving deep into our book, The Strive Method, Control Alcohol for 30 Days Before It Controls You for the Next 30 Years. Head over to www.thestrivemethod.com to purchase and receive a Santa sack full of freebies today. Um, I want right. to pick up on something you you said there, and I need to be careful and tread lightly because I don't want to be making shit up and throwing your friends under the bus. So you let me know if I am. Yeah, yeah. But, there, but, sure. e but, e but even if it if even if it turns out that this isn't true, it's still a really good teachable moment for them. It was that moment where you said, you know, I I come out of hospital, nearly die, I get a beer, and my friends are like, "Are you sure?" And you're like, yeah, I'm okay. Okay, fuck it. Let's drink then, right? Yeah, I want to, yeah. I want to zoom in on that a little bit, right? I'm going to pick on, pick on my, uh, pick on my parents here. <laughs> Again, I always pick on my parents. So you know, we went, went, went out for a birthday, um, birthday dinner the other day with Zia, and you know, they they smoke, right? So they went outside to smoke, um, but then other members of the family who I didn't know smoke went out to smoke right and i know as a former smoker that at no point 
I see. That's just me. I'm guessing, as a former smoker, uh, that at yeah, no yeah. point did my parents say to these other family members who they care deeply about and would be hor- horrified if they ever died of any kind of smoking-related illness, that they ever said to them, what the fuck are you doing? Put that out right now. I am not smoking with you. Because it is a permission thing. Mm. It, 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 it allows the shame of doing this thing more kind of like palpable. That's more, what's the word I'm looking for? Palatable. Palatable, right? yeah. Because yeah. because now you're doing it with me, so I don't feel so bad, right? Yeah, like, yeah. So yeah. If, you're, if you're out there listening to, to this, you know, be very, very careful of using your friends as a yardstick towards whether you should or you shouldn't be drinking, yeah. right? 100%, yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's, you know, it's it's easy to look back and i don't know if it's you know memories can often be not exactly you know it's the old fisher tale like every kind of changes every time yeah, yeah, yeah. you say it right so that was like you know that's my memory of it you know mm-hmm. perhaps there was a, a much more heartfelt discussion leading up to it i i don't recall it that way yeah. regardless it's like yeah i get your point though for sure like it's if and they were you know they were both in that in that same stage that i was at you know as far as like addictive behaviors right they weren't ready to give it up either so Mm -hmm. it it just made it that much easier like you say a permission thing yeah um uh palatable you know um yeah just that that whole side of it which is it's it's um you know we were talking on your podcast earlier on about my my you know alcoholism is an invisible violent dominant belief system and yeah that's that's part of it it's the it's the why parents well, enjoy drinking with the children. <laughs> it's like right? if you yeah. drink with me, if you drink with me, then you can't you can't have a go at me. Like my my um my ex-wife, you know, like no, my son can't really complain about his mom because my son drinks, right? And I often say that yeah. to him. Okay, if you think it's so easy to stop drinking and stop drinking, yeah. <laughs> you know, right. He, right. He, he hasn't got a problem with drinking, yeah. quote unquote, but he won't be able to start. Um, yeah, yeah. What would you say, Matt, was one or more of the most difficult parts of quitting for you? And how did you eventually overcome them? Yeah, really good questions. So for me, it's, um, you know, just the, like the compulsion part, you know, uh, even for me, like my brother and I talked about this because, uh, you know, my brother had uh, like a dialed down experience, but like my dad is a, it, what peeps passed away now. And it was because of complications of drinking. He, he drank, he passed away at 66, which to me is so young for, for yeah. days. And, you know, he'd been drinking since he was like 15 straight, basically no breaks, you know? And, um, so for me and him, he just, he, I remember my brother, like we, we'd always get our, you know, bubbly waters or different things when we go out to the lake down. He's like, you know what, Matt, like drinking's always going to be a reward to us, regardless if there's alcohol in it. We're just, it's kind of like the cigarette, you know, the smoker, they have to have the pen or just, it's like the gesturing. Right. So mm-hmm. for me, it was realizing and allowing the fact that like, I, you know, I can, have you know like an, an alcohol free beer i can have a bubbly I'm, i like the sounds like the opening the can different things and just not fighting it not realizing okay it doesn't have to be like water all the time i can have sparkly water i can still have fun with it because the um yeah the actual like compulsion to like oh okay i just i had like a really good podcast with lee i'm excited i want to drink now so mm-hmm. i was finding that if i didn't have something like this to replace the alcohol, the beer, uh, I got really antsy. So that was, that was the first thing. And I know a lot of this sounds, and this is like, it's, it's for me, I know. And like, if you go to like meetings, they tell you, don't just do like habit transferring because then you're still not addressing. I will get to that. But the other thing for me was, okay, how am I going to spend my time then? Because for me, the, at the end of a work day, I wanted a reward of some kind because I wanted to have some balance, quote unquote, in my life. The way I perceived balance was like, I worked for nine hours, so I get some time of myself to mm. relax. Of course, I didn't, I still am learning how to properly relax, right? But back then for me, relaxing was, you know, just hang out on the couch and slam some beer, watch whatever, right? So I, you know, that was out. I'm not going to just sit on the couch. And, and so I transferred that 
addictive behavior or need to try and balance the work-life balance by going to the gym. And I found right away, strangely, or not so strangely, that uh, working out was giving me that kind of same kind of brain chemistry and it was actually providing with much more energy, of course. That mm. part is not, not, not strange. But the actual like sort of high and everything I was getting from working out was uh, very good at like uh, replacing some of the like instant gratification I was getting from drinking. So mm. those are the two things that changed everything right away. And those are more like physic physicality things. But mind you, like you get some mental uh, rewards and such from working out, of course. Uh, for me, though, the, the main thing was finally realizing I have to address like this, these emotions that I had the like a really tough time articulating. So I've been a musician my whole life and I, I would often just kind of put it through like the, uh, like abstract, you know, releasing some music. Uh, you can put some like fiction on top of your life story. Right. And, and get it out of your system in a more abstract and safe way, because not necessarily everybody knows that you're talking about yourself. Although they kind of, I mean, is that song about you? I'm like, no, no. <laughs> why would you say that? Right. You know what I mean? So like that part, of, that part of it too happened. But honestly, like I got into the first time I, I had a big alcohol free stretch was 2012 to 2015. It was three years, three months. And that's when I really started getting into like Wayne Dyer and all these like self-help audio books that I didn't even really know existed to be honest with you. So as soon as I had started realizing what you can do with your mindset and that was like, that took a little while though, right? Because with the mindset, it's like, for me, I just, I overdid it and then I wasn't integrating any of it. So, you know, learning can become procrastination if you're not integrating it. You just kind of get yourself in this mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, I can do this. I can't. And then it's like the sauna effect. You put the headphones down you're like, okay, what the hell? What was that again? What was that thing about the stuff? You know what I mean? I like, mm -hmm. I can't remember. Like, I remember feeling good about it, but I'm not integrating anything of what I'm hearing. So, you know, just spending a little bit more time when I, when I'll listen to an audio book or if I read something, I will do like micro dosing on it essentially. Right. I'll do like three or four pages and then really take a few solid notes of what I read and then like actually like breathe on them and like use them as affirmations. Okay. How am I actually going to use this and really take my time with it instead of trying to rush, you know, achievement after achievement, book after book. And, you know, it was great at first, but I found again, it was like, it was almost like this trap, the learning trap when you're not integrating it. All it mm. is is this yang energy and you're not like giving the yin, like the allow it to sort of allow yourself, allow myself to embody it, right? So yeah, that was the other big thing. That was the last piece of the puzzle, Lee, was, was the, um, you know, so we're talking like body, like the gesturing, the mind aspect, like learning about mindset, but the spirit. And the spirit comes from, well, literally breathing, breath is spirit, is breathing into a lot of this stuff. Like I'll read something and then just like close my eyes breathe it and invite it and feel it energetically in my body and then try and replicate that energetically with me. And I'm finding now, uh, before what I would do too, and this is, sorry, I, I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but, uh, the, um, you know what, another transfer of the addiction, the one that I didn't realize until like just recently, probably in the last year was that I was still using, I'd say technology distraction achievement as my new addiction. So I would, uh, when the, when I'd have a feeling of loneliness, when I'd have a feeling of not enough, uh, when I'd have a, a, a painful memory, an embarrassing memory, I would go, oh, hold on, I'll check my tweets, you know, on, the, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. That's a bad example. That's the one I'm not on. So I'd, I'll, yeah. I'll look on Instagram for the hundredth time. Okay. Oh, look what this person's doing. Right. So I would just like <laughs> push that right back down. And then I realized, I finally realized it was reflected back to me actually by a coach I had. Mm. And it was like, oh, okay, shit, I'm totally doing that. So like what I was using drinking to do before of like, oh, I'm embarrassed. Oh, give me a drink. Okay, let's get rid of that. I was doing that with technology. So that was, and like I say, this is pretty new, uh, realizing that when that compulsion comes up to distract and push that feeling away, now I purposely go the other way. And again, getting back to like the yin energy and just, I'll often go outside. It's been beautiful the last three months. and. Um, when I get that like angry, like I have to achieve more, I, I got more stuff on my to-do list, blah, blah, blah. I know that is just, there's this other feeling coming up and then I'm like creating all this other stuff just to push it back down. So when it comes up now, I get out of the way of it and I let it come up and I go outside, 
I watch the clouds go by, I breathe, and I get curious about those feelings. I get curious about the loneliness instead of resenting it, you know, mm-hmm. instead of um, like, I feel into it and go, okay, where, where did this come from? And, you know, I think there's a little bit of like that inner child, that 13 year old that we talked about earlier that has not been properly <clears throat> reparented, if you want to call it that, or like, yeah. I've been conditional with myself my whole life, Lee. I, and I've just realized that. And that's my patterns of my, especially my dad was very conditional. We'd be on the phone. You go, Hey, how's your job going? How much money do you have? How's the, uh, is the house? You're still, uh, how's the mortgage doing? You know, it's like this itinerary <laughs> checklist. We check all that off. Then we can have a conversation, right? So if any of those are askew though, let's, let's get into that. Why have you not? Okay. Well, what's mm-hmm. going on? How's work? Are you getting along with everybody? It was so incredibly conditional that I took that on myself, right? This behavior of like, okay, I have to achieve this. Otherwise I'll be found out. And if I'm found out, I'll be embarrassed. And I don't like being embarrassed. I thought it was rejection, but it's like, I, and this is literally in the last week or so, Lee, that I, I figured this out, or I think I figured this out. I get curiosity. <laughs> curiosity. I'm getting, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going now. through the, the dark room, right? And trip with a flashlight. And, um, you know, I, I thought, okay, so uh, significance. If I don't feel significant, I'll be rejected. And there was something like, ah, okay, rejection. That's got to be one of the most key, you know, caveman days. Like if you're not part of the tribe, you're going to be rejected. I was like, okay, that's a pretty primal thing. I think I've gotten to my, like my core wound of like why I want to achieve all this stuff. And I was like, it still just felt like kind of like I was on the right path, but there was something else that was more personal to me. And I realized this a couple of days ago, even that it was like, it's embarrassment. I remember mm. specific instances just the last little while because I'm a, I am finally allowing this to come to the surface where like if I'd say something in class and then like after the teacher would leave and everybody like well that was stupid and then they'd all start laughing and I go beat red and mm. I just want to cry and run away I'm like ah it's like rejection but like the way I've personalized my rejection in my worst moments of shame and, and embarrassment have been because I've been singled out pointed at, I've gone beat red, you know, I've been laughed at, I want to cry. Then they start laughing at me because I'm crying like that kind of thing. Right. So I, those have been the most traumatic events for me is when I've been singled out and just like, you're not good enough. We're going to laugh at you. So it's like rejection. But like, as soon as I realized I can personalize that rejection in some of my stories of like just complete embarrassment. I always used to be so self-conscious when I went red in the face, hmm. could never talk to girls in high school. Cause as soon as they'd start flirting with me, be like, Psh, and then be like, why are you turning red? Matt? I'm like, can't say, I can't say a word. Right. Until, and then <laughs> until I have a few drinks and all of a sudden I can talk to all the girls, I, you know what I mean? So yeah, 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 dude, that's like, yeah. And it's cool that you catch me at this time because that's literally like the last, you know, six months specifically. And even that, like going one layer deeper into that, like embarrassment under rejection, that's like in the last like 72 hours, literally. <laughs> well, that, that, I mean, that makes sense as to why you would need to trust someone before you opened up to them as well. Yeah. That's a good point. You know, actually. because, yeah. because if, if, um, if there's a part of you that, I mean, the, 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 the school of thought that, that I use in the method is, you know, there'll be a part of you that will be really sensitive and will remember blushing and, and being embarrassed. And that part of you will be exiled. And another more protector part will, when you start to feel, when that part starts to feel like it needs some space, another part will will push it away by um, either looking at uh, Instagram or drinking or going to the gym. It, it will it will basically be saying, hey, we're not going to show the world this embarrassed, Matt. We're going to go to the gym right now and lift weights. That's what we do. And then that part always is not uh, seen. So, you know, it might be you said you work with a coach if you still do. Go and uh, have, have a few chats with this little, allow this little part of yours, this very young part to have more, get to know him more. You know? Yeah, no, it's great advice. And I, I like your um, reflecting that back to me again, because of the newness of uh, this, re- <laughs> this re- inner revealing that I've done. Yeah, yeah. Thank it, you. It'd Thanks be, for that. Yeah. yeah. It'll, be, it'll be fresh. You know, it's like we, we, we say, you should, uh, you should check out a guy called Dr. Richard Schwartz. 
Okay. He, has a, he has a book called No Bad Part. He came on our podcast, so you could approach him as well to go on your podcast. Brilliant. I will. And, um, you know, that we, uh, you know, what you're, what you're, what you've just experienced in the last 72 hours will be a part. Think, think, think of you as a jigsaw puzzle and you've right. just met it. We just met another part of you, right? Like that's exactly right. Really yeah. exciting times. Why, why did you, why did you decide to write a book, create a course, create a podcast instead of just stopping drinking? Why did you decide to go the whole nine yards? So, yeah, thanks for uh, you've given me the opportunity to say it. it's been a big relief for me. So I, I worked the same job for 23 years. I got hired when I was 16 years old. I worked at a like a regional, like a Western Canadian uh, grocery chain of, uh, yeah. So, and hired when I was 16, right? Uh, worked till I was just over 40 years old from part-time closer to assistant store manager, every, you know, every seemingly every job in between. And I found that job was getting to be very, uh, as, as, as I sobered up this last time, I'm three and a half years sober now, I realized that there was these feelings and it wasn't something I could articulate at the time, but I realized when I was thinking of the, you know, me being in this job for any time I was like, okay, I'm 40 years old this year. All I have to do is this, do this for another 15 years, right? <laughs> justification things. It's like, yeah. And then I started doing, well, I got great benefits. I just got six year or six weeks paid vacation. I got a pension. I got a pension, yeah. right? So I started saying all these things and my body, my body was just constricting. And I felt like this weight and this dread. I'm like, this isn't right. And, you know, it's like, you know, I am 40. So perhaps this is just a midlife crisis, what they call in like the 90s, such a 90s mm -hmm. term, a existential crisis, we'll call it, I guess, from today. Uh, you know, so I took six months off a sabbatical and I was like, dude, I remember morning one, uh, I had this like, it wasn't self-talk. It was like a voice inside my head. I always think it's my gramps on my mom's side. Cause I just, I really connected with him and I, we lost him pretty early. I was only 18. So I didn't get mm. to know him as an adult. So I very, very much feel him as one of my guides. So I thought it was him and he's it was morning one. I, I woke up and I started to do my morning routine as I usually do. And, and uh, vo the voice said, you're not going back. I was like, Whew, interesting. Where does that come from? You know? Mm. So I, I was at this point, I was just open to everything. I like, I have six months, you know, I, I financially saved up some money so I could support myself. So I didn't have to worry about that side of things. And I just, I was like, it's kind of similar to you. Like you said, okay, what do I like? What am I good at? What could I possibly do at this point in my life? And it came back to, um, I liked the coaching and mentoring side of things. Cause at that mm -hmm. time, I mean, I had the experience. Experience is one thing you can't teach. You just have to do, you have to put the years in the reps in. So I was at a unique stage where I was like 40 years old, but I had 23 years experience. And yet there's all these other people as the company grows that are getting fast tracked. They've been in their position two years mm -hmm. and they're like, you know, so, and they just, they haven't been through all, like the ups, downs, all arounds as I had. So I really much enjoyed seeing the gaps between between where people want to get to and where they are both mentally and just skills wise and helping people. So I very much enjoyed that side of it. So I took that, I, okay, well, what in my life can I, because like life coach is pretty, literally you could stick it in any genre that you want, mm. which is so cool about coaching. I'm sure you, mm. you, uh, you enjoy that as well about it. Uh, but then I'm like, okay. Cause initially I'm like, I want to help everybody. Right. But then <laughs> when I learn about business and such, especially when I'm like a nobody at this point, or basically for all intents and purposes, you know, and I'm competing against whoever call it Tony Robbins, you know, if I'm a life mm. coach, so is Tony Robbins. So is, mm. you know, fill in the blank. Right. So I'm like, okay. Well, what, what's my lane, quote unquote, yada, yada, all the business talk. Right. And I get it. I understand it. I, uh, you know, so it's like, what is my niche? Right. So my mm. experience was through my drinking. So that's what I decided to do. I relate really, uh, really well with, or I, I love the idea of like the hero's journey. So yeah. it's like, yeah. Like Joseph the, Campbell. Yes. Have you, mm. have you watched that documentary finding Joe? You can watch it for free on YouTube. Oh no, but I did. I, yeah. I, I, it's on my list actually. I, yeah, I, dude, yeah, it's yeah. brilliant. It's brilliant. I think you, I think you dig it a lot. So anybody that's not super familiar, just watch the, the documentary finding Joe. Uh, honestly, it shows up in so many movies and books and I'll give you like, mm. this, like the Coles notes version here. It's like, so it's like stage one is like when you're, you have, you have this like idea you've been, it's been revealed to you that there's a life, a different way of living your life. And there's going to be, it's going to be met with rejection and inner 
like the uh, the inner critic, and and there's going to be some r- refusal on your end. But as soon mm. as you cr- cross that threshold, you go into uh, section two. So crossing the threshold for me was deciding to give up drinking. Mm. So that's honestly that's when the real work begins. I mean, it was pretty challenging for me to get to that stage, but then by that time I did, okay, now that's when you have to start doing the inner work. Hmm. So, you know, you do the inner work. It's like the inner, it's, you go into the, the innermost cave or like the dark night of the soul, whatever, you know, framing yeah. you want to use it as. And that's when you really do that deep work, the stuff you've been putting off or numbing out, allow it to come up. Right. So, and then stage three is by the time you come out of that, you've had this a massive personal transformation, body, mind, spirit. And now what is it? What's like the human nature to do after that point, after you've learned something cool, you want to go share it. Right? So this is me. I'm circling back to, to stage one, finding people that are at their stage one. And I want to be the mentor for those people. So combining my previous life, you know, of 23 years, I'd say the last 12 years of it being like a, like a, you know, upper management. Right. So really getting mm-hmm. into like interpersonal sensitivity and you know what I mean? How to, how to read people and such, and then combining that with my drinking and the life coaching and different certifications I've got. And yeah. And then just helping people through their hero's journey. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of nerdy for, for learning. I'm like you, I'm a little bit more of audiobooks versus the reading, mm-hmm. although I do the, mm-hmm. the physical reading as well. So just kind of combining everything, I liked the idea of having a, a program sort of based off like a 30-day course where you can watch some videos, do some group calls, uh, you know, depended on the content. A huge part of me for my recovery and, and uh, just everything now is like connection, right? Uh, there's that whole TED Talk. I believe it's something along the lines of like the opposite of addiction is connection. Yeah. And that was like, a, when I heard that, I was like, Boom. It's just one of those times where you can hear a sentence and it just changes everything for you. I'm like, man, hundred percent, like you couldn't have said it better. So that really resonated with me. So, you know, having this community that uh, I'm sure it's the same for you and in, in, in your group as well, just having everybody to be able to find out that you don't have to be there alone. It, it made, it meant so much to me when I went for that first meeting that I went to and, and just even being in the energy of the people was enough to have this like, profound spiritual shift for me. I remember going into the first meeting. I don't even remember what the first guy said, but as soon as he opened his mouth to talk and just realizing that these people around me are like me, I started crying. I felt like this physical weight going off my shoulders and I was changed literally on the strength of that first meeting. I went to was like three years, three months basically of, of alcohol free because I, something happened to me that day in that meeting that completely switched. It was like a, uh, you know, I, I've never quite had anything like it since then. That saved, that literally saved my life. So that's the power of connection, you know. So just bringing all of that together, and um, yeah, what else can I say about it? I don't know. It's just, it's fun. It's, I like the idea that it's like, you know, it's, it's so cool because like when I get into like a room like this or I have conversations, group calls, it's like you can. It's so dynamic talking to people that have gone through sobriety of recovery of, of any form. It doesn't necessarily have to be alcohol, but mm. somebody has gotten so close to their own death or their own like like limits essentially. And then you can talk about the darkest stuff, but then also laugh about it because that's kind of a release too. You can either cry or laugh about it. So I remember there's a specific instance where I said something where I was kind of like, like we talked about, so full of shame, right? I was like in one of those rooms and I'm just like, yeah, and I, like I did this. And blah, blah, blah. I was like, just barely snuck out of my mouth. And the guy's bo- across from me, he's like, that's like my Tuesday morning, buddy. Like, don't worry about <laughs> yeah, it. I was yeah, like, yeah. what? And we just start laughing. I was like, it was permission for me to let go of the shame and like realize yeah. other people are doing this. And so it's like, it's f- like dark, but it's also, you can kind of point fun at it like we're still here like it, it can be fun too it's like mm. it, it is it's supposed to be fun right so you know uh, out of the darkness you can have this like wonderful wonderful life and just always be connected to the darkness and don't necessarily be afraid of it right like it's that yin yang that duality life is just dualities you know and so that's yeah i you know hopefully that answered your question yeah kind of no, it, a bit, but yeah <laughs> it, it, it did and um you know i'm gonna obviously uh, after this just email me a, a picture of your beautiful face and a little bio and send me the links and i'll put them in the show notes but oh, yeah, for the you. people the people currently running through the park dodging dog shit and 
stray chestnuts um where can they find you <laughs> <laughs> yeah watch out for those chestnuts um yeah uh so yeah, i'm most active on instagram i think i hinted at that earlier i'm, I'm on there a fair bit so uh the, it's recoveryroadmap.me and that's mm-hmm. my instagram handle that's also my website so easy to remember that so www recoveryroadmap.me. I also do, uh, as, as you mentioned, the, uh, the podcast beyond recovery. So it's going to have Lee's episodes coming out. Uh, you know, at time of recording, I'm not sure when this is going to come out, but it'll be mid November. So beyond mm-hmm. recovery, uh, check out the podcast there and Lee's episode will be coming out around mid November. And other than that, yeah, the YouTube channel is kind of my catch all. Cause I, I do a bit of like some sound therapy and uh, a couple other projects and such so it's matt gardner live and that'll have my beyond recovery the recovery roadmap stuff my sound therapy you know some live performances and such so uh but yeah if you want to reach out to me uh the easiest way is is just give me a follow on instagram and and direct message me and i will make sure i get back to you uh probably within the hour (laughs) Mm -hmm. awesome matt thank you very much for coming on and sharing a little bit about your story and continue doing what you're doing because you're making a difference in people's lives and that's really important thanks for joining us today buddy Thanks, Lee. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the 1000 Days Sober Podcast. Without you, the listener, there is no podcast. So thank you for stepping up today. Please go to your podcast player, rate and review the show. It will help people get to know about it a little bit more and we can save some more lives. I just want to say a special thanks to our producer, Stan, who is currently in the Ukraine. If you would like to help and support Stan and his family, email us at thestrivemethod at gmail.com and we'll find a way to do that. Special thanks to all of our guests who make this show so magical and our Strive family for uniting in our common goal to be people who don't drink alcohol and live self-led lives. And if you want to join us, email us at thestrivemethod at gmail.com. And lastly, if you enjoyed this show, tell somebody about it. You could seriously change somebody's life. Strive on, everybody.